good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, depending where you are located. So this is uh, uh, the second event that we organize on the Ma Myanmar crisis. The first event we organized um, three months and a half ago or so. It was right after the, uh, the coup, not long after the coup. And at the time, uh, what we had observed is that the two parties, the demonstrators on the one side and the military on the other side were kind of an, on a collision course. And uh, there were, but there were still at the time hopes that there would be some kind of compromise. And uh, now, three months and a half later, what we see is that there hasn't been any compromise, that the two parties are still on the collision course and the situation has really worsened quite dramatically. What we have seen is a further hardening of the two positions. The army refuses to budge in one way or the other, but surprisingly enough, the demonstrators are still on the streets. Of course, there have been changes. The demonstration is not as frequent as they were uh, yeah, three, three months ago or, or, or so, but the demonstrations are still there. And the, the population in, uh, in Myanmar is surprisingly, surprisingly really, uh, strong in, in, its, in its position. And the bravery of the Burmese population is really impressive and uh, worth uh, underscoring, I guess. Ever since this first meeting that we had in mid-March or so, there have been what I would call negative developments and slightly more positive developments. Unfortunately, there are more negative developments than positive ones. On the negative side, the major, uh, I guess, change or development is now the involvement of armed groups. And of course, due to the involvement of armed groups, the level of violence has substantially risen ever since. Another negative uh, thing, of course, also, is the huge impact that this very chaotic situation has had on the economy. There are rising concerns on the part of the business community as a, as a result. And what we see is uh, what I would call a great leap backward, which means that uh, more than a decade of progress, of economic progress has been absolutely kind of crushed. On the neg negative side still, there, are also, there were high expectations that the international community would do something and would help in solving the, uh, the issue. And what we have seen is, well, nothing <laughs> very positive on, the, on this side. The only slightly positive development that I would uh, like to underscore is uh, a number of defections from diplomats, for instance, who, who joined the civil disobedience movement, and also apparently a number of def defections also within the army. So there may be signs that some people move and change uh, sides. But of course, the description that I just gave is a very oversimplistic, I suppose, description. And this is why we thought that it was high time for, uh, for us to organize a new event to assess in more depth the uh, state of, of play in, uh, in Myanmar, to assess the situation and the probable scenarios. So for this, we have decided uh, this time to also give the floor to uh, Burmese voices to people who are, I guess, closer to the ground than we, we are as uh, experts or analysts. And so we have a very diversified uh, panel to, today with people who will provide their perspective from various different angles, the political aspects, the economic aspects, the international community aspect. So we have five uh, panelists today, and I'll give you the uh, the names of the, these panelists by order of appearance on stage, so so to speak. So our first speaker is uh, Tin Le Win, who is a freelance journalist based in uh, in Rome, and she will be providing the big picture, uh, describing the situation as it is to today in uh, in Myanmar, but really providing the the big picture. Then I will give the floor to Romain Caillou, who is uh, the principal at SIPA Partners based in uh, Tokyo, and he will be uh, providing the perspective from the business community more, so, something like this. I mean, he will give you the details in a, in a minute. The third speaker is Nyanta Molin, who is consultant on government, public policy and political risk. And he will be uh, also explaining the political situation, the uh, balance of power between the, the various uh, 
well, groups or pa parties. Uh, and he will be providing, I guess, uh, the view from, from the, the ground. Uh, the next speaker is Sophie Boisson du Rocher, who uh, is an associate research fellow here at the Center for Asian Studies at IFRI. And she will be reacting to uh, Nienta's pre presentation on the political dimension of the situation. And last but not least is David Camrou, honorary pro senior research fellow and adjunct professor at Sciences Po. And he will be uh, discussing the international community's uh, intervention or lack thereof in this, uh, in this crisis. And I will be moderating the, the discussion. So uh, of course, as usual, we would like to have as much discussion as possible. So I would like to insist and ask the panelists to not exceed the 10 minutes that they have been allotted. Eight to 10 minutes would be perfect. So it will leave ample time for discussion between you and as well as with the, uh, the audience. So the floor is yours, Tin, for uh, eight to 10 minutes, if this is possible. Thanks in advance. Absolutely, I will try my best. Thank you very much for the introduction, Francois. And thanks also to IFRI for organizing and this discussion today. I mean, Myanmar has almost completely disappeared from the global news agenda, which is both infuriating and heartbreaking. So I really do appreciate the organization, you know, continuing to shine a light on what's happening back home. Now, you know, one of the, 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 the questions for this discussion or, or the main question, uh, you know, um, for this uh, uh, today's discussion is how worse can it get? Um, well, unfortunately, quite a lot. Um, and, you know, I will try and give you a bit of a bird's eye view and then also focus a little bit on um, some of the unprecedented threats against independent media, because obviously as a journalist, you know, that that's a, a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, so, you know, I think, we, it's important to remember that Myanmar is a country that was in, under a dictatorship for nearly half a century. It really opened up only a decade ago and a full civilian government took over only five years ago. Now, this opening wasn't perfect, but it was something. And it gave people in Myanmar the kind of freedom that they hadn't known for decades or even generations. Unfortunately, in just five months, the hunter has dragged the country back by decades. Uh, people are now again living in constant fear. I think it's also worth remembering that the coup is coming on top of an economy that was already devastated by COVID-19. Now we have conflicts um, surging everywhere, including in urban areas, which is something we hadn't seen in recent history. And there is a humanitarian and hunger crisis brewing. Now, earlier this month, I actually spoke to local aid workers, politicians, and, you know, just ordinary people in Myanmar's border regions. Um, these areas are home to minority groups. And, you know, one of the, the, the questions that I've often been asked in the last few months is whether Myanmar will descend into civil war. Well, in some of these areas, civil war has been going on for decades, and the rates of hunger and poverty were already higher than the national average even before the coup. But now, this combination of instability, conflict, cash shortages, and rising transportation costs have really pushed up the prices of staple foods um, in the last couple of months. So many people are now struggling to feed themselves. Um, it's monsoon, you know, roads are often impassable in these areas, um, poor because of poor infrastructure, and that's going to put further pressure on prices. There's also concerns that some of these food shortfalls and, you know, some of the, the, the pain is actually going to extend um, to, over to the next year. Now, at the same time, you've got local aid workers who are overwhelmed. They're juggling higher needs, a cash crunch, and security concerns that prevent them from accessing areas hit by fresh violence. And we are seeing fresh violence every day um, from, you know, the, the, the accusations that the hunter has burned down entire villages um, to targeted assassination of, you know, hunter appointed ward administrators. Um, we're, we're seeing all these news uh, popping up every day and it's, it, 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 it feels like the country is on a bit of a slippery slope. Now a news assessment from the International 
Food Policy Research Institute, IFRI, um, paints an equally grim picture um, in two key crop growing regions in Myanmar. So it's not just the border areas um, that are a concern. So the Irrawaddy Delta and the dry zone, uh, you know, they account for more than 80% of Myanmar's cropped area. Um, there, if preset, the cost of inputs like fertilizers have shot up. And of course, just at the farmers are struggling with cash and credit shortages. So if pre is estimating that up to 1.87 million additional households, so households, not people, um, could be living in poverty this year. And they also added that it's not just the absolute numbers that are worrying, but the depth of poverty for households that are already poor. And the paper also said that 60% of predicted newly poor households are going to be in the Delta and dry zone. And they're urging aid agencies to extend humanitarian you know, assistance to household heirs. Um, like I said, these two areas account for a large part of Myanmar's cropped area. And agriculture is a crucial sector in terms of both the economy and the employment, particularly in terms of employment. So there are real concerns about far reaching consequences of this combination of coup and COVID-19 um, on, uh, on the country. Um, I won't touch too much on the violence issues and all, all that sort of stuff because I think uh, Nyanta will probably be able to do that. Um, I guess I'd now like to just speak a little bit about the state of media freedom in Myanmar. And unfortunately, this is also on life support. Now, I grew up in Myanmar in the 80s and the 90s, so I'm definitely aware of you know, the repression and threats that journalists faced at that time. But this time around, it feels unprecedented because however limited or flawed it may have been, we have tasted freedom for the past 10 years. Um, journalism has always been a dangerous profession in Myanmar. Neither the junta nor the NLD government have much love um, for independent media. But now if you're a journalist, you are a target. Not only that, your family, your friends, your loved ones, they are all targets too. And the junta has made it impossible for independent journalists to work. You know, they've revoked the licenses of at least eight media outlets. Reporters have been beaten, harassed and shot at. Um, the last time I checked, more than 50 journalists are still detained, including at least two of my friends. Yet, despite all of that, Myanmar journalists continue to do an amazing job, mainly thanks to a whole crop of citizen journalists who've popped up, helped with, you know, popped up to help them armed with nothing more than their mobile phones. So I have two broad appeals to the international community. Please provide humanitarian assistance as much as you can. And you can do that without going through the hunter. There are ways of sending money to local NGOs and community groups. Now is the time to be flexible and adaptable in your funding. Independent media also needs sustained support. If all you can do is spare a bit of time, then please stay engaged with what's happening in Myanmar. Please talk about it, educate others. And if you have institutional backing, please provide pr practical support, you know, from paying salaries to even helping media outlets set up offices outside of Myanmar. Now, I know I've offered a lot of depressing statistics and facts, but I do want to end on a positive note because there is a massive transformation that is taking place within Myanmar society, led mainly by the young generation. Over the past few months, we've been having discussions around topics that were taboo for a very long time. Things like federal democracy, the rights for the Rohingya, as well as many other minority ethnic groups, and some of the failures of the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, these are sentiments, yeah, that people didn't dare utter in public before. Of course, there is a long way to go. I have absolutely no illusions about the kind of work that's going to be needed to undo decades of propaganda and the divide and rule strategy. But to anyone who cares about Myanmar, if you want to help, this really does point towards the country's future potential. We've never had a chance of forging a common identity that wasn't imposed by either the hunter or the colonial masters. Now that could be a real chance for nation building. And if it is done right, Myanmar can actually become a really inclusive country. Thank you. Back to you, Francois. Hope I stick to time. Excellent. No, no. You respected the time very well. And I think it's a very important point that you made about the, uh, the chance for a united uh, Myanmar at last.
Uh, it's it's quite an interesting uh, development in, indeed, and uh, something that I should have underscored, I guess, that the idea of federal democracy is now in the air. It's been broadly accepted, and this is, I think, a major change in, in, indeed. Uh, so, uh, Roma, over to you for the impact on the uh, business community, the economy, broadly speaking. So, over to you yes. for not more than 10 minutes. Merci, Françoise, and I'll make sure to uh, stick uh, by the by the rule. Um, thanks. Uh, first of all, yes, thanks to IFRI for this uh, invitation and the opportunity to contribute. Um, I will be quite short and I re my remarks will be quite general. But for those of you in the audience who would like to go more in depth into the Myanmar economy and where it stands, uh, I will not mention two uh, upcoming events that are focused on the economy. One is later today at 7 p.m. Bangkok time, organized by the Foreign Correspondent Club of Thailand, and at which I think Nyanta will be speaking. So Nyanta, we hope we don't exhaust you now, and uh, we, we look forward to your second intervention too. And also, I would like to mention next Monday, uh, July 5, at 10 a.m. Singapore time, sadly that's very early, in the middle of the night really for uh, people in Europe, but it's, um, it's an event organized by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies with two economists that will uh, we'll be discussing for an hour and a half in depth about different sectors and issues. So I invite uh, those who want to go more in depth uh, to, 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 to attend those events. But, uh, now I'd like to speak broadly about what's happening in the economy and uh, how it impacts businesses and um, how worse it can get and what might lie ahead. And there I'd like to ground uh, my uh, remarks in my experience, personal experience with uh, Myanmar because I first lived in Myanmar in 2006 um, as an in, I was an intern at the French embassy, then Nepido had just, uh, sorry, the, Nepido had just become the capital the year before, and Yangon was a, quite a, an airy city, and uh, international sanctions were just uh, ramping up against the country. It was really the da very, very dark time. And then I returned in 2008 and stayed in the country until 2015, and as a consultant, I um, advised some of the uh, international uh, corporations and other type of organizations that wanted to enter the country as it started to experience political reforms um, in 2010-2011. Uh, and really, I, I saw a, a huge change uh, in uh, the structure of the political economy with a direct impact on the livelihood of the Myanmar population countrywide. Uh, and really, there, I think anecdotes are important. I mean, it's, for example, motorbikes. You know, when I first lived in the country, the, you know, few people were on bicycles and you had ox carts in the countryside. Uh, fast forward a few, uh, you know, to now and people have motorbikes and cars. Cars also is another anecdote. And again, I think it's important to keep that in mind um, because when we talk about uh, the, the clock being turned back uh, to at least one decade, you know, back, still, I think there are some gains that have been achieved over the last 10 years. And so I think, then that's my first remark, really is a key question looking ahead is how much this, cri this political crisis uh, will continue to have an economic impact that erases, continue to erase further the economic and business gains of the last 10 years and how domestic and international actors' uh, actions have an impact on these uh, gains coming under threat or not. Of course, the main culprits here are the State Administrative Council and the military leadership, obviously. But still, I think when one considers how to approach this political crisis, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind the gains of the last 10 years and that Myanmar today it's not where it was. Um, it's not where it was in uh, 2009 or 2010. And just there as an example, look at the telecom sector, 
look at the internet connectivity. Of course, there uh, freedom of speech, access, all of that, a lot of questions, uh, uh, data, uh, interception, of course, a lot of questions, but the, the debate is not, uh, the debate, the, the issues are not the same as they were 10 years ago when the country just had one telecom operator and almost no uh, internet connectivity. My second, so my second point will be about um, what it will take for the economy to normalize again. And I think that, that, that's a really big question and it's a really big challenge because what underpinned the, the, or the integration really of the Myanmar economy with, that, with the global economy um, was a political pact between uh, domestic actors, the military junta and the opposition forces and support by the international community. So what will it take looking ahead? And I think here we are talking in terms of years, not in terms of months to reach a stage where the new political structure that it put in place in Myanmar is acceptable enough that various economic actors can return and do business as usual. For example, here to illustrate, as you know, international financial institutions, World Bank, ADB, I think even the AIIB, even though its stance is somewhat less clear, uh, but also the Japanese government and its uh, ODS, all of those are suspended and under review at the moment. And the focus is not anymore development aid, economic development, the focus has become humanitarian aid. How do we go back to a situation where again, the, the focus is about development, economic development, not putting a band-aid on a wound that is just getting bigger and bigger like it was in the 2000s and also after Cyclone Nargis, but you know, really developing the Myanmar economy in the way that benefits the whole population. And that brings me to my next remark, which is about the new political economic order that is going to take shape and its beneficiaries. Because let's not be naive. They are not everyone is losing in the current Myanmar. We know how it was before 2010, 2011. And I think some templates will be brushed off and reused. And I, I foresee whether through coercion or uh, convincing carrots and sticks, you know, a number of businesses, and not only Myanmar businesses, but also international businesses um, or other type of actors, giving their support to the state administrative council and the military junta in a way that protects it to pressure both domestic and international. And um, so I think, you know, we're gonna have to watch who is a new class of cronies and they're uh, looking ahead I think it will be interesting to see, for example, who bids for the ongoing solar power tender, which I think ends in a few days, and how many Chinese companies, notably, will there be taking part in that tender, or from other countries? And who are their uh, financiers? Who, which uh, financial institutions uh, will they be getting uh, financing from? And again, I think these type of indicators are going to tell us who is going to work on the political economy side with the junta in order to help them uh, solidify their control over the, the, polit the politics, but also the economy. So my last remark really is, a, is about how not to make a bad situation worse. And I think there, uh, there is no easy solution. I understand the, the, the reason and the moral imperative to act but at the same time, it's essential not to act in a way that would be counterproductive and further the, this crisis. I know there are a lot of discussions around the coup de grace, as we say in French, right? The blow to the structure that is going to make it fall. What will be the key sanction or sanctions that suddenly will bring this regime down and it will be over and a new democratic order can emerge? And sadly, I just don't believe that such a coup de grace uh, tactic uh, exists. Um, and now that does not mean that one should not do anything, but I think it's very important to be cautious in one's approach. There I'll give an example, which is about around uh, tax. You know, there is a pressure on uh, domestic and international businesses since the February one coup for them not to pay their uh, taxes to the Myanmar uh, 
government, because it's now under the control of the military forces, with the assumption that uh, money should not flow to uh, an, el an illegitimate regime. And I understand the reasoning there, but as a international, as the Institutes for Human Rights and Business, sorry, has written in a recent paper recently, um, in the past, when the regime did not have access to uh, income or tax income or foreign currency, they found ways to get their hands on it. Whether it was through the exploitation of natural resources, linking with actors in the illegal economy, or for example, spending less on education and health, and making sure that they get enough for weapons. So I, I think, you know, so there, the, the question is to what extent not paying taxes, not uh, promoting the legal economy can lead to the rise of the further rise of the illegal economy. Again, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not proposing a solution here. I just want to put forward some dilemmas, which I think are really important to be taken account because sometimes by wanting to do good, one can make the situation worse on the ground. And so I'll, I'll, um, I'll conclude there just with uh, uh, just to illustrate the situation for businesses, uh, mentioning uh, one of my clients, which, which will remain unnamed, of course, but uh, it's a Japanese company. They have a very small operation in Myanmar. They are in the construction. They do manufacturing of construction products. They have a small branch office in uh, Yangon, and they work for distributors. And the question that they have now is, the question they have is how do we protect the safety and security of our staff? And uh, how do we make sure that we do not work with distributors for our products who might be linked to the junta? But I think most importantly, and that's the thinking at headquarter level in Japan is when the situation reaches such a level of crisis and reputation risk and the rest that being in Myanmar is more liability for us than you know, it brings any economy, it makes any economic sense. And I think that's really where I think it's important to keep in mind that the gains of the last 10 years are, some of them are still there. And uh, we could lose much more in the coming months and years as the situation gets worse. Well, thank you, Romain. And thanks for uh, insisting on uh, the need to avoid being excessively naive. You know, moral grounds, are, are good, but there are some other considerations also to be taken into account, which makes the, uh, the decisions particularly complicated. Uh, I agree with you, but I, I think it was, it was good to underscore that. All right, the next uh, in line is uh, Nyanta Molin. So Nyanta, the floor is yours for the uh, same thing, about uh, 10 minutes maximum, please. Thank you, Francois. Uh, you'd asked me to speak a bit on the, the various actors and, you know, uh, a little bit of my assessment on where things are headed. So I think it's important to understand uh, what we're talking about in terms of the landscape. So on one side, you have the SAC, as Roman has laid out, uh, backed by the military leadership uh, using security forces in, in my view, well, what is still an attempt uh, to normalize and take full control of the country. Uh, on the other side, in opposition to the coup, uh, you there have a much more, I think, a varied group of actors, and key among which is actually also, you know, let's not forget uh, the the general public. And what we have seen played out over the, the past few months is essentially, uh, I, I think, strategy is a strong word, uh, but it's certainly becoming that, and that one that uh, centers on essentially, you know three main themes, right? So first is, of course, what you saw in the early months and still continues uh, uh, in a much smaller form, which are the, the nonviolent protests, you know, mass uh, street protests, um, and within which I would also include uh, the now, uh, I think, quite well-recognized civil disobedience movement where you've had thousands of uh, government employees, civil servants, uh, that initially also some in the private sector uh, refused to take part in government under uh, coup leadership. The second is, of course, the political challenge to the legitimacy of the SAC and the military that is being spearheaded by first uh, the committee representing the Bidon Zufoto, uh, essentially the elected representatives from the 2020, November 2020 elections who came together in the early weeks 
uh, have and have, you know, I think dialogued with various groups, continue to do so, uh, have formed a national unity government uh, that challenges the state authority and legitimacy of the SAC domestically and on the international arena. And then third, the more recent challenge you touched on for us at the beginning, which is uh, what is in effect now becoming an armed revolution. I'll quickly go through the three. What we've seen with the protests uh, in the early weeks, you know, reaching a high of probably millions in uh, not just large cities, but towns and villages across the country has essentially been forcibly suppressed by security forces and uh, you know, now more or less exists in, in a much you know, smaller form. You'll see, continue to see uh, in large cities like Yangon and Mandalay, but also in smaller towns, second tier towns, you know, groups of 20, 30 people protesting, um, coming together. They've tied this together with an overall uh, boycott campaign, which has moved much faster, uh, for example, than international sanctions and maybe at a certain level has actually been much more effective in highlighting uh, military-owned businesses, businesses linked to the SAC and SAC membership, uh, products and brands being boycotted. Uh, and this has really formed the core of the nonviolent movement, right? I forgot this, uh, the one part, which is the civil disobedience movement, which is probably the most vulnerable. I mean, civil servants have always been uh, relatively poorly paid in Myanmar, but nevertheless, you know, thousands of doctors, engineers, uh, you know, department officials have uh, either now been uh, arrested, detained, forced to resign, or have just refused uh, to go into work. And within which I would actually include members of the security forces themselves, even within the first few weeks of the anti-coup movement. And what they're protesting, you know, as Roman laid out earlier, is you know uh, a coup that uh, it's not just a generalized dissent against the military, right? Which that undercurrent of, I would say, uh, a base political consciousness has always existed in Myanmar, right? That, that, that the general fear of the military being in charge, but it's also, I think, in response to the decade of political and economic gains that the country has made, and that now have been overturned by the coup. And it is this threat to, you know, the, the you know, what has been the increased political freedoms, um, the, 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 the gradual, I think, prosperity that arguably, you know, uh, for those of us like Roman and I who've been in the country before uh, 2010, 2011, uh, you know, it's, it's a really stark difference, right? And that, that grievance is key to understanding uh, where this public sentiment is coming from. And it's not enough to think that, you know, uh, the sentiment dies because, you know, compared to, let's say, past social movements in the country, here you really have that, that, that uh, a, a deep-seated sense of loss uh, uh, that, that serves as the basis for uh, this dissent. The contesting of the legitimacy of the SAC is critical. So you've seen CRPH uh, that has now formed the national unity government that is in a loose knit alliance with different ethnic political groups, which are uh, important players in Myanmar, even before the coup. They include ethnic political parties as well as ethnic armed groups. And in the case of certain organizations such as uh, what you have with the Kachin uh, Independence Organization and its affiliated army, and the Karen National Union and its affiliated uh, National Liberation Army, uh, you have really oh, quasi political forces that have both uh, their own internal political dynamics, you know, uh, governance, uh, but as well as uh, a long history and experience with uh, armed struggle against uh, successive military regimes in Myanmar. And this resistance has also uh, uh, been successful uh, on certain stages. You've seen, of course, the Myanmar's representative in the UN uh, join the civil service, uh, civil disobedience movement, uh, really pose a threat. There are gonna be questions about how that plays out with the UN uh, Credentials Committee meeting later this year. And the, the very tough question of whether or not to accord 
recognition to the NUG or the SAC. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, regardless of where the, the, their standing currently is and it's headed under international law, uh, it certainly has received political support. Uh, it's without a doubt uh, the legitimate body in Myanmar, right? So that, that contestation has been won. Uh, and that's really more the SAC is doing rather than uh, NUG. Uh, on the international stage, as I mentioned, if not outright uh, recognition, uh, there are different levels of support uh, that are coming in, even I think in many instances from the countries, the member states of the UN that uh, we may at least expect from. And this construct is important. I think it serves as the, 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 the political uh, core of the protest movement. And from this, what you've now seen is the development of this third wing um, of challenge to the SAC, uh, which is uh, armed struggle. I don't think it's too far off to say we are on a trajectory for uh, extended, uh, protracted, and escalating violence in the country. Uh, we need to recognize that this is at a scale and a level that hasn't been seen in the country in decades. You're talking about right now, maybe six to eight weeks since the first instance of armed conflict against the security forces. Today, right now, you're seeing uh, virtually daily attacks on police and security outposts against the uh, junta appointed ward and uh, village track township administrators that currently serve really as the, uh, the, the, the intelligence network, informant network, for the SAC as they attempt to track down, hunt down uh, dissidents. And you are seeing uh, this kind of kinetic action for the first time in a long time extend into urban areas in Yangon, in Mandalay, in the first and second tier cities as well of the country. This is no longer the kind of internal conflict uh, that is limited to the peripheries, you know, to the ethnic states of Myanmar. Uh, it is really coming into the heartland. And I think it's important to recognize that what you're seeing now uh, is, a, is on a trajectory, is on a curve, right? In the sense that it can only escalate. Uh, the, this is probably the most interesting aspect, if I may say so, uh, in this uh, 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 current crisis, because you really have a situation where armed opposition actors, and it's really a mix of uh, loose-knit self-defense forces that you know, came out of uh, groups from the protest movement that decided nonviolent protest wasn't enough. It's evolved into people's defense forces, which are essentially uh, recognized and uh, being, uh, in a certain uh, sense, guided by the NUG as well as various portions of the traditional EAOs. And what is, I think, particularly significant is these new groups, right? These, these self-defense forces and the more organized uh, people's defense forces. They are gaining prominence in some areas. I think they have, you know, if you look at the Chin Defense Force, uh, which is not a PDF, which is, which is a local effort in the Western uh, state of Chin, uh, they have been, they have grown in prominence in, uh, if I may, in the kind of military uh, armed efficacy than the traditional armed group, the CNF, that existed there before. And they are uh, really, they have been really able to, uh, to, to create, you know, significant um, impact on, on the security forces. And I think this is something that uh, points to a shifting dynamics, even within the military, that perhaps are not as visible when you're looking from the outside. And I think it is that challenge that we, we need to take into account uh, when we think about what the right kind of international response should be. Because the traditional image of the military, the Demaro, uh, as the only institution uh, you know, with its extensive capabilities, I don't think that image is holding inside the country right now. Right? So it's not just the increased confidence of the opposition armed groups that are fighting the SAC, but in terms of the kind of data, the kind of intelligence, you know, and then 
just in terms of what is publicly visible vis-a-vis uh, -vis these attacks, it points to a military that perhaps is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, not quite where it was uh, compared to 10, 20 years ago in terms of manpower, in terms of training. Uh, it points to internal uh, challenges in morale uh, within the military. I think this is really important to recognize. So you may not see uh, large scale troop defections yet. I say yet because I know certainly this is one of the things that is uh, on track to happen or, or being worked towards. But at least what is visible is the, the general unwillingness. And I think uh, numerous instances, news coming out now of a willingness to uh, cause sabotage, or provide information or collaborate with opposition forces from within the military. And we also have to remember that, you know, the coup itself has threatened the, the, the self-image uh, you know, of the military as, as the guardian of the state, right? The coup was in breach of the military designed constitution. It has, I think, created shakiness for the old guard uh, that had gained security, immunity, uh, and prosperity under the political and economic transition of the country uh, allowed by the 2008 constitution. And all of that is being now threatened by this coup. And it is certainly a factor to take into consideration when we try to think about where the dynamics, the internal dynamics of the military are headed as we move forward. The last thing I'll touch on is, you know, just touching on Rahman's point about sanctions. Sanctions uh, are something that Myanmar has had extensive experience with. But I think one of the things to recognize is this is also a, uh, a, a political economy uh, within which the military has uh, both uh, been reduced in size over the past decade, but it's also become more dependent on international linkages compared to the 90s, right? compared to the 80s. And that vulnerability to sanctions, I think, goes both ways. Now, what the right kind of international response should be, I think we can leave for the discussion. I'll stop here. Thank you for your Well, thank you, Nanta, for this very comprehensive overview of the various uh, forces in place and for uh, explaining that things are not as simple as uh, we uh, sometimes think, and particularly with regards to the military. So thank thanks, but thanks for that. Well, Sophia, the floor is yours for uh, some uh, quick reactions to Nanta's presentation and explanations. So the floor is yours. Unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Francoise. Well, I'm going to be very short anyway. Thank you to all of you because we have very interesting uh, uh, points here. Um, I just would like to uh, jump into what Francoise just said that uh, things are not as simple as it appears. Um, and in fact, I would like to go deeper into uh, the appreciation of the situation because from Europe, uh, we don't really have a clear, um, a clear um, evaluation of what is happening on the ground, you know? So we know about the disobedience uh, movement, we know about um, the army uh, attempts to uh, control the situation, but I would like to go deeper, you know, into, uh, into this, um, this evaluation because you have more information than what we have. Um, so let's begin, you know, basically I would say we have um, three main groups as far as I understood, first, you know, the civil disobedience group, then uh, the army, and then uh, the armed groups. Um, let's go first to the um, civil disobedience uh, movement. Uh, what I uh, what I would like to um, to to go deeper into is the uh, boycott campaign that you touch upon, Nantia. Um, how how far is it um how far is it achieving you know a real impact on the uh, army uh, gains you know financial gains you know um is it really followed by all the population uh and uh, what um what can we expect you know are the reaction uh, from um the army economic uh, holdings you know that that's uh, that's one point um, I would like also, and, uh, and that's, that's the first point. On the disobedience group, I would like also to, uh, to try to evaluate, you know, how, what kind of percentage of the population 
is following the um, disobedience movement, you know? Uh, is it, are we talking about 80% of the population? Are we talking about 40%? Is it rising? Is it declining? Uh, that that could be also very useful, you know. For instance, you talk about uh, bureaucrats and civil servants um, still sticking to their uh, non-cooperation um, uh, movement, you know, with the uh, with the uh, gender. Um, for instance, the doctors, you know, we know the situation is out of control for the COVID-19. Uh, how far can they stick to this non-cooperation uh, uh, position? And, and not, you know, help the people on the ground, you know, how does it work, you know, really, you know, that, that could be also, uh, that could be um, uh, interesting for, for us here in Europe. Um, then uh, we have the, we have um, the army. Um, I, I heard about, you know, the military gender denouncement committee within the army. How reliable is it? How, is, how does it work? Uh, what do you know about the splits, you know, uh, uh, within the army? Uh, we have no clear uh, evaluation, you know, because some people here uh, are talking about, you know, this, the weakening of the army because more and more younger officers are now, you know, uh, putting into question, you know, the uh, interest of the, of the coup. Um, and that's, you know, a new, a new mindset, you know, within the younger generation of, uh, of officer. Is it, is it really shared or is it only, you know, the, you know, like a, a kind of, um, of uh, 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 I would say, a, a disorganized um, questioning, you know, is it something that um, is, uh, has, a, has a strong basis, you know, because the younger generation, I would say, you know, the, the uh, 35, 40, you know, they, they just know that they can't go the same way that, uh, you know, the uh, 60 to 65 or 70 uh, years old um, officers uh, is going. So that, that could be also, uh, that could be also um, uh, a question. And another question linked to this one is, how far does it tr do they try to impact on uh, the agenda position? You know, how far do they try to um, support a compromise? Um, so that's uh, and and to find, you know, I would say a sustainable solution for the country because, um, as Francois said, you know, at the at the uh, at the beginning of this uh, seminar, we are on a collision course and it's hardening. You know, so. Do they try to do something, you know, to try to soften? Because it's, a, it's a, I would say it's a zero game, uh, zero gain game, you know? So um, that, that, that's one, that's another question. Then um, I'd like to, um, and, and by the way, is there uh, any attempt by the military uh, to make the situation attractive, you know? Um, that, that's also, you know, and to try to, to build up, you know, on a on a on a uh, on a, um, on a new on a new compromise. Uh, then the last one is the armed groups. Um, that's also very confused, you know, because um, armed groups and ethnic groups are they are they uh, converging, you know, to the same solution? Do they have diverging interest? And um, indeed, they are, they are against. I mean, the coup, but they are not working for the same result. Indeed, you know. So that that's also uh, that's also one um, one important question, just to try, you know, um, just to try to uh, evaluate, you know, the chance of um, I would say, uh, as Francois said uh, earlier, a federal uh, solution. You know, we have been talking about this uh, solution for very long. I remember, you know, the debate within the NLD. In, uh, in 2014, 15, you know, I remember the, the, the topic was already on the table, you know, on the agenda, um, but it, it's really hard. And we know that, you know, uh, it's um, uh, 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 Myanmar is, uh, I would say, is, um, is an, um, uh, an imploded uh, uh, nation yet, you know, so it has to build uh, its, um, its own identity. Uh, but if there is, you know, right now, I would say an opportunity to, uh, to, um, to do something and to really work on this new identity, um, how far can it last?
you know, and on what kind of uh, what kind of basis um, uh, on the ground, you know, uh, I would I would say, you know, with this um, the uh, the armed conflict, um, did you did you notice a shifting dynamics? Uh, what would you consider to be a strong signal of a shifting dynamics? You know, that, that's also uh, that's also one point uh, here. Um, so that's basic question. I will I would come back anyway. And another point is um, uh, Tin has talked about you know the the the, the difficulty to uh, communicate now uh, in Myanmar uh, with you know the army uh, having control of uh, the media, but also you know on uh, the cyberspace. So logistically, you know, functionally, how do they communicate, you know, these groups, you know, uh, on the ground, you know, that, that's also um, an open question for us. And I think it would help us to better evaluate, you know, really the, uh, the, 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 the spirit of the uh, struggle for uh, democracy uh, in Myanmar. Thank you. Okay, so be, so before I give uh, the floor to to David, perhaps Yanta, could could you react to uh, the many questions that uh, <laughs> Sophie asked you? Uh, but I guess uh, about the the boycott campaigns and the effectiveness of these boycott campaigns, and then the uh, well the dynamics within the army, and in sure. particular the generation aspect, and finally the chance for nation building, which is something that uh, Tin Le, uh, Tin was alluding to. Uh, so uh, I would like to have your view on that as, uh, as well. So if sure, you could re quick. react relatively briefly and then I'll- As quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, so we talk about the three themes, right? And the different groups and uh, let's, let's not get too caught up in trying to separate them out into distinct entities because they overlap and link up. Uh, specifically on the boycott campaign against military, military linked or SAC linked, who linked businesses and sources of revenue. Uh, what a boycott campaign can do is impose costs, uh, deny uh, revenue and markets to uh, consumer facing brands, right? And to consumer facing products, uh, potentially to supply chains that are critical in the, the production of those goods and services. And we have seen examples where, uh, for example, in terms of consumer goods for the military, this may be beer, this may be tobacco, military linked brands have taken a significant hit uh, in the past four or five uh, months uh, because of this campaign. This has escalated to attacks on the uh, cell towers, the mobile communication towers of, uh, tel of the telco company owned by the military. Right. So that's that's an example where it's a slightly different uh, an escalated kind of campaign. But fundamentally, what are the military, what are the SAC and the, 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 the military leadership's sources of revenue? And that's a much more complex question that ties to state revenue, as Roman has pointed out, in terms of, you, you know, uh, tax collection, et cetera. It ties to certain industries such as extractives uh, that are not necessarily as easy to target, but are being targeted. And the example that I will give you, for example, is we all know about mining, in particular jade mining. And jade mining is an industry uh, that is hugely uh, illicit in the sense that there is a formal portion and then there's a pretty hidden in, in a gray or black market uh, portion uh, from which many actors derive benefit, by the way, but of course, including the military. And the escalation of arm attacks up in Kachin State in the north, where the mines are loaded, located, you can only uh, dig for jade in a particular or in particular parts of the country. Uh, the, the insecurity around that has certainly challenged the ability of that industry to function. Uh, we can talk about uh, oil and gas, right? And this is not necessarily as easily accessible, but the broad public opposition to oil and gas companies by Burmese, uh, by the general public, by campaign groups, unfortunately for which, you know, uh, Total given its prominence uh, seems to consistently get the most attention, but it's not of course the only actor in that industry uh, is, is another area. And this is my, th th these might be uh, the kinds of industries that are uh, for which there needs to be further discussion on the right kind of action that is not, because it can't just be driven from the ground. It, it, it requires, uh, potentially requires something else. When you talk about uh, 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 disobedience, right? So there are people not working. And you, you touch specifically on COVID. And one of the things I want to talk about on COVID, because I worked on COVID in a private capacity 
uh, and it, you know, let's be frank about where Myanmar's healthcare system is uh, before the coup. And the, the, the only chance of managing COVID would have been access to vaccines. And under the democratically elected government, the previous government under President Nguyen Myint, the state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, Myanmar had begun to uh, acquire uh, vaccines through the Serum Institute in India and other sources. And that would have been the best way. The ability to treat you know, uh, cases, we don't have intensive care units in the country of any note. We are estimate what back in uh, March, April of last year, you know, the moment you cross 1500 cases uh, that require ICUs, Myanmar would have been finished. That was our assessment. We crossed that threshold uh, even before the elections and the country was already struggling to, to control that. Interesting enough, we did not see the same kind of mortality rates elsewhere, but that's a whole other question, a whole other story. So the impact of the coup on the COVID situation has, you know, yeah, there's a reduction in the ability of, uh, uh, of public health services. And that's not necessarily just a function of doctors on strike. It's a function of security on the streets. It's a function of uh, the availability of budget. It's a function of the ability to track data uh, when uh, government services and other logistical services are being disrupted. So if, if you look at it holistically, yeah, we're, we're, we're headed in a bad situation now, especially since we're getting some of the new variants, but the grounds for being able to address that were already tenuous, were already uh, vulnerable even before the coup. And that's a very different question, right? On the significance of uh, you know, sentiment within the army, I think it's a little bit hard to portray it in a way that uh, I think captures the essence. I, I, I talk about the old guard a lot. And what I mean is retired uh, military, retired generals that benefited under the previous regime, but that were also involved in overseeing and being a part of the political and economic transformation of the country uh, back in 2011 their livelihoods, their families are threatened by the coup, let's be frank. And there are many indications that some of them, uh, ex-military, are also being detained or under house arrest or some, you know, some form of uh, control. If you talk within the active service personnel, you are seeing defections. Uh, they are probably now, if you include ground troops, uh, you know, we're beginning to cross a certain threshold. But I can tell you, uh, in, within the early days of the coup, you probably had, uh, I would say, somewhere around 50 to 100 uh, different officers, middle, mid-ranking, you know, uh, upper mid-ranking officers, reach out, reach out to the opposition, say they did not want to be a part of this, and they sought guidance, right? So there is a sentiment inside that is not easy to come out in an institution like the military, because they're not going to go outright, it's it, you know, uh, into open defection. Uh, you 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 have to understand how the military controls its staff, right? They've moved families into barracks uh, since March. They've moved families into ministry compounds up in Nebido. They've cut off cell phone and mobile data access to those families. They've tried to cut off news to their own troops, and it's just a standard operating procedure for an institution that has its own culture, that has its own narrative about its role in the country, that has uh, beaten in that narrative into its recruits, but now over the past decade has struggled to recruit, right? Has struggled to recruit in the sense that if you are a 16, 17 year old farm boy out in Ayaudi, you know, in 2009, there weren't many economic opportunities and you know the military really was one of the few forms of social mobility that's recognized the past decade has changed that equation for many and you have seen recruitment suffer right you've seen estimates of median age and it's 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 a much older uh, officer corps because they just don't have the rank and file that they would have had a decade ago you have also seen uh i think the the overestimation based on structure. Because when you think about 
uh, estimates of military strength. These are these are estimates based on our understanding and publicly available information on how companies are set up, how divisions are set up, battalions, et cetera. And those figures that we currently work with are based on theoretical full strength. And with the figure that is commonly cited is you have a, you know, an armed force, including auxiliary corps, support, you know, et cetera, that numbers uh, roughly around 350,000 plus, some say 400,000. I think what we, we are seeing today, and this is corroborated by sources within the military, this is corroborated by the EAOs that are seeing the evolution of uh, battalions in their areas or close to their areas, like the Chin State uh, up in Karen, uh, the estimate is a fraction of that. And what that means is it could be 120,000, it could be 200, 250,000, uh, but the but but a fighting force capability that is still under a hundred thousand, right? And I think the calculus is not really relevant uh, because you know the military is other things that the PDFs don't, that the EAOs don't. The, the military has an air force. The military has artillery. But it's important in terms of understanding troop morale. It's important in terms of understanding the future trajectory of the military and its capability of restoring order, working through battalion camps, small battalion camps that theoretically should be around 350 to you know, 700 per battalion, but in effect, in reality, probably are closer to 100, 150, in many cases, 50, right? And what that means is it, it, it is a fighting force that is going to rely and be dependent on uh, logistical convoys, you know, constantly uh, uh, providing uh, or risking uh, uh, troops, transport, and personnel uh, to feed and back battalions at threat right now. And it's dispersed. It is a long-term challenge. It is probably why we should not underestimate where the PDFs and the EOs can take this conflict. Because what we're seeing now is a snapshot based on you know, groups of young people that just started you know, getting training uh, in uh, late February, early March, right? Those are the early core. And these are the ones that you are seeing responding to a much better, theoretically much better equipped, theoretically much better trained fighting force and somehow succeeding. The number of people who are going out, who are going out to, uh, to get training and coming back, that is going to increase. They are going to bring back that conflict. I'm not making a value judgment here, but I'm making an, a, 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 an observation about trajectory. And I think uh, it's important for us to recognize that uh, uh, this is where the country is likely headed. Uh, if you think about shifting dynamics, the shifting dynamics are beginning now. You are seeing uh just in the past week so in addition to the daily you know bombings of you know uh, uh, encampments uh, police stations uh, attacks on uh sac you know the informant network you're also uh, beginning to see attacks on uh bases that are resulting in significant military casualties but timed and coordinated with attacks on the convoys that are coming in to back up those troops uh, under fire and succeeding at it, right? So this is uh, it's an important dynamic. There are all kinds of, you know, I think factors that'll go into how this plays out in terms of resources on both sides, I think fatigue. And what I'm, the only thing I'm saying is that let's, let's not settle into assumptions about the military and its ability to restore control. Because right now, uh, everything that we see challenges that notion. I'll stop here. Well, many thanks. That was extremely uh, clear. And I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very important information because I, I'm not sure that we get it uh, totally right. Okay, well, David, now the floor is yours for the uh, international community's reaction or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. I'll, I'll try and be short because I think it's much more important than we hear 
our Burmese friends uh, explaining the, the domestic situation. The people of Burma know that, that the evolution is in their hands, the resolution of the crisis, the end of the coup is in their hands. Um, the international community will play only a minor role. Okay, let me try and be sh schematic. Myanmar is an international orphan. Myanmar is an international orphan. It has three, it has kindly but unengaged aunts. That's the West, the US, the UK, and the European Union. It has self-serving uncles, uh, China and Russia, and it has rather useless cousins, uh, the countries of ASEAN. So let me deal with the three those three groups. First of all, the kindly but unengaged aunts, the US, the EU, and the UK. Um, after the coup targeted, there was a very rapid condemnation, a first round of targeted sanctions, a second round of more uh, further targeted sanctions also affecting uh, companies linked to the, uh, uh, to, to the military. The problem is that Myanmar doesn't have a champion. This is one of the consequences of Brexit. In the Brussels bubble, Britain is long, no longer there as it was previously uh, to be, in a sense, the, the champion of, of Burmese democracy. Um, there's no leadership within the EU. Um, the smaller countries are, are, are willing to follow whatever comes from the External Action Service uh, and the external, European External Action Service, uh, Joseph Borrell, has decided, like the United States, that dealing with the crisis will be subcontracted to ASEAN. And, and that has been the general Western response. You know, ASEAN will deal with it uh, for the international unity. Uh, I think the term is, this is a cop-out. This is a cop-out. It is a de dereliction of responsibility. Um, the most disappointing for me has been the European Parliament. Uh, parliamentarians are much rather spend their time tilting at windmills about the Uyghur and about Hong Kong, uh, rather than talking about a situation where they can bring about change. There is some hope, however, it's at the parliamentary levels in the French parliament and the British parliament, even in, in the Australian parliament who just published an 80 page report um, that the, it's parliaments who are engaging with the uh, national unity government. Okay, so they're the unengaged, um, kindly but unengaged aunts. Uh, to come to the um, self-serving uncles, uh, this is China and, and India. Um, it's debatable whether China actually supported the coup. Uh, the, this is a question that's still being asked. What is clear that since the coup, the coup, uh, it has been the most proactive in engaging with the junta and giving it really the de facto recognition. Um, and uh, China has legitimate security interests. Uh, and I've always said that China needs Myanmar more than Myanmar needs China. Remember that under the military over the last 10 years, uh, supplies of weaponry has been diversified to, to, um, to Russia. Um, the other uh, self-serving uncle is, is India. I think the most disappointing of all the international re reactions uh, is that from India. Despite being a membership of the Quad, who supposedly the four great democracies of the Indo-Pacific, I, I think we should forget this. I think the technical term is bullshit, that uh, India is a default democracy, the world's greatest democracy under the under the Hindu nationalism of Modi, um, it's quite supportive of uh, authoritarian regimes. And it's significant that both China and India abstained in the vote uh, a week ago in the United Nations, uh, condemning the coup and, uh, and asking for an arms embargo. Okay, let's, let me come to the third group who are the, um, who are the uh, rather useless cousins. Um, there's a general consensus that what is happening in ASEAN is a real credibility test for, for ASEAN. Uh, it took uh, two months, three months after the coup for the first summer to occur, uh, three months after the coup, uh, the only person listened to was General, uh, Senior General Min Ong Lung, who was invited, given some degree of de facto recognition. 
and, uh, and the opposition was not uh, called for. Um, in the vote last week uh, at the United Nations General Assembly, ASEAN showed its divisiveness. Five countries voted yes, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, because of its UN ambassador, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, but, uh, and Vietnam, I should add. And uh, four countries abstained, uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. So within ASEAN itself, you know, there's no consensus of what they actually want to do. Um, two months after the, after the summit, we still don't have the special envoy appointed. Uh, and uh, basically, General Min Lung went back to Nompido and said, well, thanks, thanks, uh, cousins, for your helpful advice. We'll take it into consideration, but we'll establish stability uh, first. Okay, my conclusion, well, I could talk about Japan, uh, um, who has tried to play a more sort of neutral role as the largest supplier of overseas development assistance and a great deal of foreign direct investment. Japanese companies have been more proactive with companies like Suzuki abandoning a project and Kirin also ending their relationship with, uh, with the military. Okay, my conclusions. Um, I think that we're paying the price today, or Myanmar's paying the price of Aung San Suu Kyi's defense of the Tatmandu at the International Criminal Court. Uh, once the, the, the West has always related Burma to Aung San Suu Kyi. Once she fell as a democratic I icon, then uh, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. The baby of Burmese democracy uh, was thrown out with the bathwater of the democratic icon. Uh, as I said, Burma is a victim of Brexit. There's no longer a champion. Uh, what the crisis has revealed is ASEAN systemic weakness. ASEAN has no carrots and it has no sticks. You know, once Myanmar joined in 1997, I mean, we know this kind of problem in Europe with our friend, Prime Minister Viktor Orban in, 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 in Hungary. Once you're in, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the ways of bringing about compliance and bringing about a change of behavior? So we see ASEAN's systemic weakness, the importance of the non-interference principle, which is far more important than the seventh principle of the ASEAN Charter, uh, which is the defense of democracy and human rights. Um, the international community is subcontracting sub rather to ASEAN, I see as being self-serving. It gives a nod to uh, ASEAN centrality. Uh, it's a diplomatic nicety. But it's one thing to give a nod to ASEAN centrality. It's another thing to actually believe that it exists. Okay, and it, it can actually bring about results. Uh, Sophie may disagree be with me on that point. Um, uh, and yet the paradox is, I mean, the, the other problem is that the everything is now seen within the lens of the Sino-American rivalry. And from this perspective, uh, I would argue, and I've argued this with, uh, with, with uh, Alex Ung Kant in a recent op-ed, is it's in the US interest to confront and engage China in Myanmar. This is where you know, the, 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 we have the convergence about the pivot towards the Indo-Pacific and the defense of human rights and democracy. You know, this is the trope coming from both Brussels and from Washington. Hang on guys. Get on with it. You know, here's a, a, a golden opportunity uh, to walk the talk, as the Americans say. Uh, um, okay, what? So some dramatic action is required. One of these could be recognition of the national unity government. I certainly think that parliaments in democratic countries are pushing in that direction. Um, we're also seeing the importance of the uh, the Burmese diaspora. The countries where Burma is on the agenda, the UK, US, Australia, are countries where the diaspora plays this strong political role. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of European countries don't have such a large uh, diaspora. Okay, so dramatic accent, what would that mean? It would mean that the principle of the right to protect uh, could be invoked once called for by a government like the national unity government, which is considered as legitimate. 
but that's an hypothesis. But as I've said, the situation will be dissolved by the people of Myanmar themselves. They know that they have they're not naive about uh, about the fecklessness of the international community, but they still require our support. I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Uh, well, any reactions from uh, our Burmese friends to uh, what uh, David said about the, <laughs> the role of the international community? Uh, Tin, you want to add something to that? Um, I guess just to say I completely agree with David. I mean, it's been an absolute disappointment um, you know, in, 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 in how the international community has failed Myanmar, you know, both the, the, the wider inter commu international community at large, as well as the neighboring countries. And just, I guess, you know, uh, uh, um, a point that, that, that David made about um, subcontracting out to, to, to ASEAN. And I think it's just so much easier, right? Just so much easier for the international community to say, oh yeah, they failed, um, we tried. But it, it, it's it's the ASEAN. So ASEAN's also in a in, in a pretty you know difficult position. Um, although I don't particularly feel feel sorry for it. But it's just it's you know there are rarely uh, uh, I, I feel occasions in history where it is so clear that you know one party is so in the wrong, and this is the military junta, the SAC, the State Administrative Council. You know, and yet. Yet there is still nothing. You know, five months on, nearly 900 people have died, over 6,000 detained, 5,000 still in jail, and still absolutely nothing. It's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, we are the international open. Thank you, David. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to steal that quote now. <laughs> copyright. <huh? laughs> no copyright. Yeah. <laughs> Jan, have you, do you want to add something before we uh, move on to the questions? Yeah. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, I think, David, what you touched on is, is, is spot on. And what is, I think, confusing is it, 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 make, it you know, I understand the dynamics within, uh, for example, the Chinese foreign policy apparatus and ASEAN uh, based on, you know, what we commonly understand about the military and then the projections on the chances of success. But the dynamics have shifted and we've not yet seen a reassessment, a strategic reconsideration because at this point in time, where we're headed, what I just laid out earlier, we will become a source of regional, if not international threat to peace and security. You're talking about uh, a revival of a conflict economy that even to this day, before the coup, right, put Myanmar on the map in terms of uh, the narcotics trade and other kinds of illicit economies that are a necessary byproduct of conflict. And we're going to back to that. This doesn't serve China's interest. This doesn't serve ASEAN's interest. And moreover, the, the, the SAC and, and the current military leadership, and I, I'm, I'm very careful to make that distinction, right? The current military leadership, the manner in which they've approached the, the response to the coup by Mei Han, uh, is not quite rational. Itself has not undergone a strategic reassessment. Their thinking, their strategy remains the same as it did on January 31st. And that's a danger. And that's a danger for the region because it is not based on um, a projection of you know, where this is headed. So do you want, to, as China, as Thailand and Singapore, do you hook your, you know, your, 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 your foreign policy on uh, that kind of thinking and that kind of leadership? It's very dangerous. So he, he's just come back from Russia. Uh, part of the discussions that the commander in chief had in Russia include uh, uh, the uh, discussion of uh, the allowance of uh, naval docking uh, by the Russians so under the con under the military's constitution. Uh, you know, no government of Myanmar is allowed to set up, uh, it, it can, can approve or can allow the setup of foreign uh, military bases uh, on its territory. He is opening up that discussion, right? And it, you know, it's, it's, if I were China, I would look at that and I'd be concerned. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Before I give the, the floor back to uh, Sophie and Romain, so uh, if you want to ask questions, don't hesitate to use the uh, Q&R, uh, box at the bottom of the of the, the screen. So Sophie, you wanted to add something? 
unmute yourself and here you go. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like just to, to question David, you know, a uh, point of view and maybe to try to nuance it. Um, we know, and as far as I have contact with my uh, ASEAN colleagues, we know that um, ASEAN underground, I would say diplomatic networks are uh, active, um, active to very active with um, the Burmese um, resistant diplomats and um, with the uh, national unity government. Um, there, there is not absolutely nothing, you know, on the ASEAN side, uh, but there, is, there, there won't be anywhere any um, open or confrontational uh, position. So um, I think it would be wrong from the EU or the US to put, you know, ASEAN in a corner um, and think, you know, that they won't do anything. I think they are doing things, but uh, in the ASEAN way, uh, as we know, and uh, we should remain open to, um, you know, alternative solution or alternative diplomatic options uh, with ASEAN. That, that's just a, a, a point. Okay. Yeah, Romain, you want to add something? You yeah, raise your hand. That. Yes, thanks, uh, Francoise. And uh, just briefly, I mean, I sit in Japan, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll say from here there is maybe two remarks. One is, um, oh no, why another crisis? We have so many things on our hands. Damn, what 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 is Myanmar doing? We don't we have too many issues already. China, Taiwan, etc. So I think that's first. And second is prisoners' dilemma. Is oh, okay. We have to move hard on it, but if we move hard against the regime, then do we lose all the investment we've made over the last 10 years and the billions we spend? And then what about China or others? And I think the same uh, reasoning is happening, you know, in uh, various ASEAN uh, countries in India. And so I think there's the, the lack of leadership, I think, as David has mentioned, um, and also the lack of an alternative yet or seen as, as a somewhat as a somewhat credible alternative to the military regime and things may change i think as nianta has, uh, has highlighted the situation on the ground is not as stable for the military regime as what they like to depict and then you also have various dynamics um, reinforcing the, the opposition movement so maybe things will evolve but i think at the moment uh, from where i sit the situation is very much well wait and see and likely, that's you know, likely the military regime will consolidate its control. It won't be perfect, but it will be better than what the opposition can do. And we don't necessarily want to um, deal with them, but they are going to be the only game in town. And they will hold. Answering a question in the in the box, they will likely hold elections within a year and a half, two years, soon enough, and that will uh, bring back an imperfect democracy, but hey, how many perfect democracies are there in the region anyway? What about Thailand? What about Malaysia? Let's talk about Vietnam. So again, I think when you see, look at it from this region and the, the, the geopolitical uh, dynamics at play, Myanmar is kind of like marginal and no one really wants to uh, dip his toes in the water to, to, too much. But because of the dynamics on the ground, they might have to, and their hands might be tied in the very near future. So with the, yeah, about the, the um, holding the, the democratic elections, well, so what do you, do you think the, uh, the army will stick to its words? Anybody on, on that? I mean, we, we heard uh, Roman's position, anybody? Well, just very briefly, the timings have changed, right? Um, Min Alain and the State and Ministry of Council seems to keep sort of shifting the goalposts here, there and everywhere. They originally talked about a year, um, and then I think they sort of uh, uh, broached the subject of making it two years. Um, and I think the most recent one, uh, which um, I think uh, um, Nyanda can correct me if I'm wrong, was when I think um, Min Alain gave an interview um, on Russian television when he was in Russia very recently. He, he said about 24 months, I think he said about two years, but you know everything has been prefaced with, oh, oh, we need to get the country to be stable first, which is a catch all phrase that could mean anything and everything. It could be another 20 years before the elections because the country hasn't stabilized. You know, that's that's going to be the excuse they're going to use. Um, and we, yeah, we just don't know. 
Yeah, okay, there, there is another question about the diaspora. Well, it was mentioned very briefly. Can it really play a role? What do you, th do you think this is possible? Well, we, we heard that uh, it is not present everywhere, you know, in all countries, but in, in the countries where they, it is present and pretty large, it can play a role. So what, what do you think the, this role can, can be for the Burmese diaspora? Anybody on that? Um, uh, well, I guess I'm part of the diaspora, so I will, will try and touch on it. Um, there are large diasporas, you like, yes, like David said, you know, in the US, in the UK, parts of Australia, um, um, other, other ASEAN countries as well, Malaysia, you know, Singapore. But I think it's, it, it, I think we also have to remember, you know, the type of diaspora. Um, in these particular countries. Um, some of the countries like in the US, um, particularly, I think um, there's a, a massive refugee population, you know, in Fort Wayne. Um, that's where a lot of the, 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 the refugees that used to be in the Thai Myanmar border, Thai Burma border were resettled. Um, and, you know, and there is a lot of push because these are people who left um, post 88 and, you know, they were politically engaged. And then you've got some of the other diasporas, you know, particularly in, in, in places within the ASEAN countries that move there for studies, for work as, you know, I guess in a way you could say economic migrants. And I think um, in, in a broader sense, a lot of the diaspora has been, have been very active um, post-coup in this situation, you know, ranging from protesting to doing social punishment um, against, you know, the, the, the kids, um, of military leaders and social punishment, I guess we haven't talked about it, it's essentially, you know, sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, pressuring them on social media, um, mainly online, but also sometimes offline, um, so that the children of uh, the, the military leaders who, you know, um, would very gladly close the doors on its citizens, so they live in poverty and fear, but their children and their family members live abroad um, and enjoy the fruits of the de democratic countries elsewhere. So to pressure them to sort of either denounce their families or, you know, make it difficult for their life. So, you know, they're engaged in it. But I think, um, we also have to also remember, uh, and this is this could be a controversial opinion, but some of the diaspora also are extremely conservative. Um, they left Myanmar in the 80s and the 90s, and they want Myanmar to stay that way. And that doesn't, you know, that that's not exactly that, that, that that's not the future Myanmar should be heading towards. Well, thanks for uh, for this point. I think it's a very important one. Uh, there's a question about the, uh, China. So to what extent might the Chinese be also playing another type of cards with some of the um, ethnic armed organization they used to support? So what do we know about this, their possible involvement or aims, in particular in view of the open turn to Russia by uh, Myung-Leng? So who wants to try on this one? I'll have, I'll have a crack. Yeah, sure. I, think, I think that's a really great question. Um, if China wanted to put pressure, on the EAOs, and the, the key among them being the KIA, KIO, which is up north in Chen State, uh, has uh, one of the, the key border towns, you know, on the China Myanmar border, uh, Liza, but also you know spread out across most of northern Myanmar. Uh, if China wanted to put pressure, they could they could uh, put pressure through the border trade, uh, access to resources and supplies. And that hasn't happened yet, as far as uh, we are aware. Um, but I think for China, I mean, this is, uh, well, I think David, you raised a point earlier, you know, the, was China behind the coup? Did it back the position for the coup? I, I, I am not convinced by that because the coup makes no sense. If you think about what the, 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 the situation was in terms of bilateral relations, in terms of um, the evolving uh, stability and trajectory of the political economy, pushing aside COVID and its effects back in 2020 for a bit. Um, if you look at that trajectory, this coup makes no sense for China's relationship with Myanmar. Um, it is unfortunate that uh, Beijing, and I think I don't think some of the advice is necessarily originating in Beijing, um, but the, 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 the foreign policy stance that China has taken uh, in, since, the, the, since the early weeks of the coup uh, in that kind of tacit support and later uh, what is de facto recognition, right? Inviting uh, the SEC appointed uh, foreign minister, Wenan Maolwen, uh, to Chongqing 
uh, having uh, one of the TV channels interview me online as the leader of Myanmar. You know, that sort of, uh, that sort of, I want to say nonsense because it, it, it doesn't help uh, uh, their stance. Uh, it doesn't jibe with what should be, I think, a more rational consideration of events on the ground and, and, and uh, their possible trajectory. So perhaps there is uh, 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 the possibility for a shift in thinking. Um, and what I mentioned earlier about the, 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 the Chinese-Myanmar border in terms of the access to that border by the Kachin uh, may be a, a, a facet of that. It may be a status quo. We, we, we're, we're not entirely sure. But we also have to wait and see, like I mentioned, uh, the, the, the Russian trip is, is quite recent. Uh, so it's altogether not quite clear how that can evolve. The overarching I... assumption we make is about China's economic interests, right? The, 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 the millions of billions they want to invest into the, the economic corridor, the port, the deep sea uh, port they're working off the coast of Rakhine, off the coast of Rakhine, the, 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 the pipelines that run the, the course of the country of Myanmar into Yunnan. Uh, to protect these assets uh, and to assume that they are protected by working with the SAC and the military, I think is a very flawed calculus because the kind of threat that, you know, that infrastructure can be potentially placed under, it's no longer limited to, you know, territories under which you have the traditional EAOs in Rakhine, in Kachin, in Northern Shan. Uh, it's shifted now, like I said. So in the heartland of Myanmar, in the Central Valley, in, in Bama, majority towns like Monyoa and Zakain, territories through which the pipeline and that economic corridor passes. Today, you are seeing armed action, a significant armed action that is posing a significant threat to military personnel. And I think something has to shift in their thinking. Sorry for cutting you off, David. No, I just add to that, uh, that when we talk about China's policy towards Myanmar, we should keep in mind that not everything's decided in Beijing and that at the local level, the regional level, you know, there are double games. Uh, Rungo mentioned uh, illicit trade. The, the figure for declared for Jade, I think it's officially 140 million euros, dollars rather, in 2019. And the unofficial figure is probably 10 times that. Um, and that's going through China, or a lot of it's going through China. So, you know, there are, there are games being played at the local level, regional level, provincial level, which are not necessarily being decided in, in, in Beijing, and which may actually be in, uh, in contradiction with uh, what may be decided in Beijing. Thank you. Uh, Sophie, one, one very short word, and then uh, I would like to conclude because we are uh, running behind schedule, and I would like you to make some recommendations about what could be done. <laughs> yeah, so, a, a very short question to our Burmese colleagues. Uh, some national representatives in the US or even in the EU say uh, that they won't recognize uh, the national unity government because uh, the Rohingya are not represented uh, within the government. Uh, what do you think of the argument? Do you think it's only a bad pretext or uh, what's your opinion on this uh, tricky issue? I can have a quick quack. I mean, I, I, I think if you think of the NUG and CRPH as a political construct that is meant to challenge uh, the legitimacy of the SAC, uh, then you know, that, that kind of uh, response by uh, communities, uh, diaspora communities outside, uh, can be seen as uh, unhelpful. But, you know, I think then touched on this earlier, if you think about the dynamics inside the country, right, there are really two kinds of, if I may say, use the word, uh, two kinds of revolutions going on. One is this anti-coup movement that is a response to February 1st. But the other is uh, because of the space opened up, I would say, um, the discourse that has been opened up by the coup, going back to first principles, we, you know, we cannot have a situation with a military that is uh, above civilian control and again trying to run the country. And be, we can't have that because it has consequences on the lives, on the, the securities of different communities. And it has opened up uh, narratives and dialogue about the experiences of uh, communities, minority communities, 
um, including the Rohingya. Uh, but let's be clear, it's, you know, it, this, this is a, you know, this is the, a common consequence of military rule in Myanmar. But that narrative has been opened up to a new generation, right? That, that, that I think that space for understanding and appreciation and real empathy. So I think that discourse is, is, is a work in progress. I, I think it's a very important facet um, and I think that kind of criticism, uh, you know, uh, this, this is, this is uh, fair and this is to be uh, expected. And if representation, you know, if democratic inclusiveness is what we are fighting for, right? And that's the point of perspective by these movement actors, including in the NUG and CRPH, you know, they, they, they would be wise to engage and listen. It's happening. Just to be clear, it's not that that kind of engagement and dialogue isn't happening. I think that's the other facet that gets you know uh, missed in international coverage, uh, and namely because it's also it's difficult to cover. And for many reasons, you're talking about secret talks, you're talking about uh, quiet dialogue, bilateral, multilateral engagement among different internal political actors. But there is that going on, right? And that that is something that we we also need to be uh, keeping careful track of. I'll stop here. Okay, well, by way of conclusion, I would like to you, you anybody of you, any one of you, uh, to go for recommendations to corporations, companies, what should they do, and recommendations and or recommendation to governments. So what, what is the right approach going to you to try to solve this crisis? So who wants to have a go? Not too long, of course. <laughs> one, two minutes, who wants to try? I'll just oh, recommendations to companies. What should they yeah. do? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what I say would be recommendations to companies. I did give, you know, sort of broad appeals to the international community for both the media as well as in terms of humanitarian assistance. I think one another very broad thing that I would just want to say is 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 and and not specific recommendation, but again building on what David said about you know Myanmar is more than Doan San Suu Kyi. Myanmar is more than the NLD. It's a country of 54 million people, many of whom just want to live a decent life, free from fear. <laughs> just do anything you can that will help. Yeah, I, I, the, the point about Aung San Suu Kyi is definitely a very important one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that would be the last word, I guess. Very, very quickly. I think, I think for, for governments, uh, you know, David's made the argument quite strongly. Uh, the SEC is not a reliable, stable partner. It doesn't sound like they're going to be able to normalize at the kind of level it needs to, to take place, at the kind of level where you can justify, you know, a kind of realist quality kind of uh, approach. Here, I don't think it applies. We really need to look through uh, a new lenses at this uh, current crisis. And uh, in effect, this is also an argument that ties into recommendations for the international business community, um, especially those that are present on the ground. I mean, this is really a period of, of, you know, uh, of serious reputational risk and a risk that is not just about international perceptions in terms of the available actions to international businesses, but also your domestic you know, uh, stakeholders, your employees, your buyers, suppliers, you know, the consumers of your products or services. And that sentiment, I think it, it is very important to be sensitive to. Um, if you talk about reputational risk, if you talk about uh, the kind of potential public backlash, local businesses are facing this. And you've seen prominent international businesses face this. So I think more than ever, it is important to think about the long game uh, and it's important to think about, you know, uh, the kind and listen really to the public uh, concerns on the ground, you know, that can really make or break brands and operations, not just brands. We're at the stage where uh, it's hard to say where, you know, the kind of opposition to uh, the perceived uh, undesired stance or action by a foreign business or entity, it's hard to say where it will come from, right, um, to, be, to be perfectly frank. So I think that kind of sensitivity is important. Um, I, I appreciate the, the survey, uh, Roman, you can maybe, if you had a chance to speak on this, that the Japanese businesses did about, you know, with their employees, that really brought out the sentiments. It's not that the, you know, the people of Myanmar want business and investment to leave. It's the current crisis, the insecurity and the instability that has been generated by the crisis. And I think the robbing of futures, you know, the robbing of gains made over the past decade that people are in opposition to 
And I think if you're going to navigate this period well, it's it's you know cultivating that sensitivity. It's it's listening, um, and I think being very very uh, prescient to 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 public sentiment on the ground. I'll stop here. Well, many thanks to all of you. We uh, ran over time, but it was a very uh, exciting discussion and very rich discussion. I'm afraid we'll have to meet again at some point because I'm uh, I'm afraid the uh, the solution will not be found anytime soon. But thanks uh, thanks to all of you, and uh, well, hope to see you again at uh, at some point. And we'll keep an eye on uh, on Myanmar. Don't uh, <laughs> don't despair, uh, Tin. We will keep an eye on uh, on Myanmar. It will not be uh, out of sight for us, at least. I agree that it's been uh, kind of neglected over the past uh, couple of weeks. But you know that's the the way it is with the with the media, which is really too too bad. Well, we we'll do our best to avoid this. So thank you, uh, thank you again, and thanks for the uh, public for staying so so long. And I hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs>